Ecstatica, or Ecstatica State of Mind, is a survival horror slash adventure game released for DOS in 1994. It was developed by Andrew Spencer Studios. Andrew Spencer's name features prominently as he worked on the title for six years, many of those years alone working on Ecstatica's unique 3D engine. Where most modern games use polygons, essentially triangles, to make up the shape of a model, Ecstatica graphics from the landscape, with a few exceptions, to the people, from head to toe, are composed almost entirely of ellipsoids with garo shading, giving a distinctive look to the game and a smooth, loping quality to the animations. As I played, I did rediscover a few early implementations of novel gameplay features. Control-wise, the game is atrociously dated. The numpad is used, and my gaming keyboard does not have a numpad so I needed to rebind those to a more sensible position using DOSBox. There's a button for picking up and using each hand, and you're expected to juggle quest items against holding a weapon. With a sword, left hand use button is an overhand strike, and the right hand is a sweeping attack. The default 5 on the numpad will allow you to duck, something I forgot to remap and didn't use for the entire game, which speaks to its effectiveness. Most combat can easily be reduced to stun locking or powering through enemy attacks. Direction keys control movement, but you cannot turn while moving and have to stop, reorient yourself and then carry on, as if the character is less a person, more a poorly built Robot Wars project. This would be fixed in the sequel. There are a number of features that would, in another place in time, be considered innovative. The function keys control your speed, from a run to an actual sneak and there are various places to hide along the way, particularly useful for an early implementation of a nemesis figure, the wolf. There's also no interface to speak of, and health loss is represented contextually through the character's poses and animations. The fixed camera angle can be a cause of frustration, either obscuring an exit or just complicating any sort of mental map of the location. Outside of these issues, and any sudden death by trap, the game is by no means difficult. It is relatively short and consists largely of a fetch quest, which can be tackled in whatever order you wish. I'm putting the spoiler warning nice and early here, since the game is packed full of visual surprises. The game begins in Northern Europe in 928. The significance of that date is unclear, but the reason is to probably place it within the so-called much maligned Dark Ages, which I can't think about without a Reddit historian in my head um actualing me that they weren't so dark after all. By default, your character will be male, but you can choose to start a new game as a female. This is the superior option for peak ellipsoid dummy thickness. So your horse strains against your voluptuous orbs as you wind your way through a cliffside path. The manual fills in the blanks of a story of someone on a journey riding their horse too hard before deciding to stop at a nearby village called Tirish, only to find it in the aftermath of an assault by an assortment of savage creatures. Along the way you discover some sources of information on what's happened here. Ecstatica, some sort of witch, disguises herself as a maid and steals a tome of magic from the castle sorcerer. Confident in her druidic skills, she experiments with the secrets within, inadvertently freeing a demon from its prison within the stone circle. Ecstatica, possessed by the demon, flees deep into the castle's dungeon. What happens next is undisclosed, but when you arrive in town, half of its occupants have already been murdered by a coterie of intelligent monsters. Whichever direction you choose, you have a good chance of running into the wolf. The wolf is a menacing pursuer, trying to track you down and get hold of your precious ellipsoids. If he catches you, you'll enjoy a humiliating torture sequence before a scripted escape. He can be killed after spending a ridiculous amount of time wailing on him. The wiki says five minutes, but the wolf can be evasive. It may take much longer. Doing so will probably also kill a large part of the tension. To reach Ecstatica and the demon possessing her, you will need to complete a small list of tasks, 
typical of adventure games. Like making a potion to turn yourself into a squirrel, or get knighted by the Lady of the Lake. gain an audience with the Skeleton King. Along the way there will be numerous colourful vignettes, sometimes adorable ambushes, other times scenes of gruesome violence. And you can't forget about that wolf. Ultimately, to meet the demon you need to retrieve a relic, and to defeat him you fashion this into a fire stick that blasts a ball of fire. The demon welcomes you to a table and you have the option of relinquishing the relic in exchange for a reward. Or fighting and saving the girl. The game borrows heavily from folklore and legend which it wears clearly on its sleeve. But there are some genuinely creepy moments, made all the more unsettling by the game's unique graphical style and often clashing use of tone. For this reason, I still remember Ecstatica. No. In this part of the video, I like to explore tropes and look for other works that impress themselves on my psyche in similar ways. The Ecstatica wiki adequately documents the game's creatures' origins in fairy tales or stories, but the trope of a town that has come under a curse is common to the horror genre, with probably one of my favourite applications being from the grandfather of gothic horror himself, Edgar Allan Poe in The Devil in the Belfry. The Dutch town of Van der operates to a clockwork precision with its perfect arrangements of houses and synchronised schedules. When the clock rings, the entire town pauses to count along with the ringing of the bell. A strange man comes to town and seizes control of the belfry, and when the appointed hour of noon comes shortly after, they count along with the bell to a count of 13 o'clock, exclaiming, De Teufel, the devil, and the town slips into a supernatural chaos. I think it's meant to be a story about stifling conformity, but in my head I always get it confused with the origin of the Skaven. The enemies also target you with a mischievous callousness that's very reminiscent of the Evil Dead series. My fair lady, ha! And in other ways, the game's simple graphics and saturated muddiness. It reminds me of the famous painting of Don Quixote by Honoré Dumier. In other ways, the surreal lipsoid graphics, the insouciance of the evil critters, reminds me of that terrifying kids film from 1985, The Adventures of Mark Twain. Time has not been kind to Ecstatica, but nevertheless the simple yet unforgettable character of the graphics depict a humble town defiled by acts of wanton violence, in a way not really seen again outside of its sequel. The colours are bright, the details murky, but the surreal scenery sticks in your mind like the sticky sap of ellipsoid plants with their ellipsoid leaves, and wall surfaces made of curious ellipsoid cells, a special ritual involving a devil's dozen of eggs, and a megadose of lysergic acid in a cemetery on a full moon on Halloween could allow one's ellipsoid eye orbs to enter into occult frequencies that will reveal to you the world of Ecstatica. Maybe. A rare Windows port also exists with sharper details, running at 640x400 SVGA, which makes it more closely resemble the sequel with its sharply defined special eyes. The MIDI soundtrack provides a surprising amount of atmosphere. The opening ambient drone appropriately sets up an oppressive tone to the start of your adventure. Here it is on my soundscape. Another track gives the character of a lunatic carnival my favourite type of carnival. Uh -huh. 
Too often though the music will fall away to silence, and the only thing left to remark upon are the bare bones sound effects and a handful of voice chirps, and I have nothing good to say about those. No no no. Is Ecstatica a game I would recommend? Absolutely not. Short of curious archivists like myself, from what I understand the sequel improved upon it in every way, but here your biggest fight would be against the controls and the confusion of the fixed camera and dated visuals. Is that pixel an object? It isn't. It's not an object. The objects look like objects unless you misplace them. That aside, it's impossible for me to not respect the effort Andrew Spencer took in realising such an unusual game filled with such a sense of menacing mischievousness. Although I knew I was in for a dated experience, I did not expect to be surprised with some genuinely innovative gaming features or sometimes taken aback by the depictions of violence. We also see an example of an enemy that can pursue you through a game a year before Scissorman at 1995's Clock Tower, or well before the Nemesis in 1999's Resident Evil Nemesis. We see an early example of stealth, though this trait is probably inherited from its bastard bloodline as a hybrid of an adventure game, as it's implemented in a very similar fashion to the sneaking of Quest for Glory in 1992. The Ellipsoid graphics too are a novel implementation of early 3D. Now in the modern day we are at a point where people feel some sentimentality over the Dorito-shaped people of a bygone PS1 era. But instead, Andrew Spencer dared to dream of a world where everything was made of ellipsoid balls, resulting in some unique visuals to fit a strange and disturbing fairy tale. On this channel we can acknowledge a game's flaws, while celebrating the interesting and unusual things that leave behind these little ripples in our memories. So here's to you Andrew Spencer, and the balls you dropped into the pond of my mind. I just wanted to thank everyone who recently subscribed. I uh, can't know your reason for doing this, but it tells me I'm doing something right. I also want to thank my good friends Lou and Cracker for their support. Being a total sigma, I kind of neglect them sometimes. So I'd also like to warn everyone else in advance. Though it might seem I may neglect you, my growing Gilga Chad and Gilga Jane children, I hope to never truly leave you. Until next time. Keep it weird, folks.